hello everyone. I'm very excited to introduce uh, my friend, uh, Chris Self, who co-founded Beckin Capital. But what's more important to me than just that he's a founder and a CEO and he's got a lot of success is that he is living deeply held values about sustainability, about resilience, about creating healthier environments and, 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 and it's an and, it's and creating a positive economic return. And in many ways, Chris represents truly the inspirational um, peak of the mountain that all of our social businesses seek to climb. We want to show and prove that there are different models of how we structure capitalism, how we fund companies, how we support organizations that are not extractive to the point of harming our planet and harming our environment. And it's just really exciting to have Chris here. I'm so thankful that uh, his schedule allowed him to give a talk at our event. And I'm also thankful for his friendship and his support. He has been instrumental in helping shape many of the thinking uh, much of the thinking that has been going into first rate. So Chris, thank you so much for everything and the floor is yours. Um, I am, Luke, I have to say that I'm deeply flattered by, by that introduction. And I want to say that the feeling is mutual. You know, your friendship has been really important to me and the learnings, you know, I've learned about all sorts of um, ideas uh, through you from participatory budgeting, agility, ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So your thinking infuses mine as much as you're suggesting mine might infuse yours. So with that, I want to say hello to everybody. Um, and I'm really excited to be presenting to you all. Um, so I want to take you um, on kind of the journey from uh, the meta um, which was the inspiration for um, the work we do and I think that we'll be doing all together because I think working together is fundamental to it. Um, just a snapshot of background um, about myself before I start the talk. I worked uh, for my vices. Um, for many years, uh, I ran uh, global investing for... BT, Bankers Trust, the Australian subsidiary of, of uh, Bankers Trust, former Bankers Trust New York and Global Investment. And then I set up an ESG fund, hedge fund called Five Oceans in the noughties. And what was clear to me was that, you know, we were trying to get capital to make a difference that, that actually great returns are derived from investing in sustainable value creation. And what was clear was that the way capital markets were functioning, they were more part of the problem than the solution. And actually, in order to deliver quality, sustainable returns, we needed to rethink things. And that's kind of the genesis for what we've been doing. We delivered a paper to the World Economic Forums Associated in Australia in the mid noughties uh, sorry, 2015, and that's the foundation for the thinking I'm going to share with you. So I'm going to do the infamous share screen now. I'm going to go through this. Um, I'll try to be relatively quick because I'll open up to questions and so forth. But you'll see, I think, through this, also how this dovetails, I think, intensely with the work that Luke is doing and participatory budgeting. So um, as here we go. Um, what I'm going to do is have a call to action here and igniting potential. You know, so great economies, great economics are really built on people feeling a sense of authorship and responsibility in how they generate value by meeting needs. So let's just go on. A, we're going to go on a journey. Before I start the journey, um, this is very Australian. It's very important to us that we acknowledge the country that we're on. I'm currently in Redfern in Sydney. This is the land of uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, we recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. This is really important, not just for what might be tokenistic or symbolic, but the First Nations of Australia 
were intensely generate, uh, connected to place. And one of our drivers is people and place and reconnecting to where we're coming from is fundamental to the journey. I think we all need to take in the reimagination of the economy. With that, let's look at the world we're in. Um, I think people, I make a generalization here, but there is um, a feeling of powerlessness that is endemic across large parts of the world, the United States, Australia, many parts of the developed world. And if you spoke to, I would argue the majority of people, there is a failure in the system, which is self-evident to most people in their experience. You can see that in the politics, the division, divisive politics. You can see that in the stories in the media. You can see that in health and well-being. Uh, people think there's something wrong. What is it? If we look at some of the evidence and look at some of the economics here as to the foundation of, as to what we see is wrong, um, it's interesting if you look at incomes for uh, the average person, and these are US figures, uh, the median income and, and the income of, of people at the lower levels, our working class has gone sideways for 40 years. Um, that whilst income for the wealthy has gone up. At the same time, we're seeing real interest rates have been at zero or below zero for almost 20 years years. Now, this is not a symptom of success. Interest rates are at this low level because not because the system is working, but because it's not working. We are not distributing the benefits widely across the economy to create sustainable, healthy growth. Um, um, so people, you know, there are a few other ways of thinking about this problem. Firstly, people are worried about their job, their current jobs. They may be new jobs, but are they good jobs? And they're worried for good reason. So what we're seeing is that people are working more. You know, it's not that people are working less, they're working more, even though their incomes are going sideways. That is certainly disconcerting. And clearly there is a concern with uh, the rise of AI and other kind of process augmenting technologies that a robot might take my job. Where am I going to? Particularly as I grow older, where is job security? Uh, at the same time as this is taking place, it's ironic. We see the stock market, obviously, as everyone is aware, has boomed. That boom in the stock market, in part, has been driven by um, the really low interest rates. You know, those really low interest rates um, are making house prices, not just the stock market, but house prices are now unaffordable for significant parts of the population. But it's very interesting when you actually look at why the stock market is going up. Um, if you look at who is actually buying the stock market at the moment, uh, the graph on the right is really interesting. You know, at the same time as we see uh, the process dynamics of robotics, et cetera, um, driving productivity enhancement within large companies and replacing work. Um, so job security is going down for individuals at the time that profit share is going up and incomes for the wealthy are going up. So when you look at who's buying the stock market, you find that households and institutions, that's pension funds, are actually flat to contracting in this scale. The biggest buyer of the stock market are companies buying back their own stock, i.e. the computers, the robots are buying themselves. I compare this to 2001, a space odyssey. Hal is now the computer programs behind Apple, Google, and so forth, buying back their own stock. Little wonder the share market, as the companies get more profitable, the share market goes up but it has, at the same time as this is happening, people are losing their jobs in these companies. So what's interesting is that globally, loosely around 70% of employment is in areas that are not these big companies. It's small businesses, it's government related, it's um, charities um, for purpose, uh, not-for-profit companies and so forth. So the stock market success sits in, um, stark counterpoint 
to the experience of a significant portion of our population who feel increasingly insecure. Does that leave any surprise as to the nature of the politics that we're seeing in the world at the moment? Um, into this environment, we had the COVID crisis. Um, so the COVID crisis was like a match being thrown into dry tinder. I mean, these trends existed before that. Um, so what we see from that is that the centre has is seen widely as failing. Um, big, uh, what we're seeing is that big organisations, whether they be government, academia, big corporations, are not delivering outcomes that are uh, supporting the well-being of a large part of the population. There's a common thread in all of this. And the common thread is scale has made organisations, and I'm, I'm making a sweeping generalisation, but the risk here is that scale is making organisations and people stupid. Now, that's an aggressive statement, but I want to unpack it. If you look at the 19th and 20th century, there is one big uh, driver that has driven the wealth expansion, uh, one trick that we keep extrapolating uh, to drive the improvement in output, and that is scale. And what I mean by scale is the improvement in process efficiency to drive down the average cost per unit produced. The logic of scale has meant that uh, organisations have all driven to get bigger. So big government, big in academic institutions, big business, big finance. Um, if you look at that, that is about each of these organisations have moved towards trying to optimise one or a narrow set of controllable process steps that they can get to maximum efficiency and minimum cost. So when we look now at a big company, there, there are some other things that happen when you start doing this process optimization um, methodology. There is um, widespread studies and evidence which show that organisations that move more than about three steps from their stakeholders increasingly take on tendencies which you might describe as sociopathic. And what I mean by that is that the uh, optimization rules within the companies become more about the optimization within the company to its own rules than for the company delivering to stakeholders. So you will get career advancement um, by um, uh, meeting internal rules. The state, the human, so while companies can talk about human-centered design, um, the internal rules become uh, dominant. You can also see this in terms of the language of risk management. So if you are the board of a large organization, so, and we could say a large complex organization, the way you manage risk most effectively is by trying to keep your decision rules as simple as possible. So we've got a contradiction here. These massive organisations, which are unquestionably at least three steps away from their stakeholders, but many more, being driven by the optimization of decision rules and for risk management, the simplification of decision rules, means that when they're dealing, it's better to make people fit narrow boxes. In Australia, the classic example of this is in the financial markets for banks. So in, in Australia, America is a bit different, but in Australia, what we see is that when um, uh, banks make loans to small businesses, rather than doing complex assessments of the risks of those small businesses, the banks tend to use a simple decision rule. That is a mortgage on your home to manage the risk for a small business operator. And that's a much easier thing to optimize against than um, uh, making uh, qualified decisions around the vast array of complex variables for any individual business. It means that, there's less than, that there is less that can go wrong in a decision. The board will be held um, not in breach of its duty of risk management if the big complex company keeps its decisions simple.
and based on simple decision rules. In or, and that's the scale logic extrapolating out. As a result of this, what we've got is organizations are significantly biased towards focusing on one uh, process logic and optimizing it. And so then we get a matrix of interfaces between large scale entities optimizing at large volumes a narrow number of processes. So um, you can see a branded good company, for example, will outsource to a consultant who does massive scale consulting and strategic analysis. The branded good company is a vertical um, uh, silo which runs the relationships of the brand values to the consumer. It will outsource strategy to a significant point to a Deloitte or some other strategic um, uh, consultancy. IT will be outsourced to an external provider, you know, Accenture, um, and so forth. So you get big, you get this matrix of uh, big companies serving one big vertical thing versus a big consultant, uh, big IT supplier, and the thing goes on. Um, what that creates or tends to create is dislocation from the uh, provision of adaptive services to local individuals um, and local needs. Um, so it's better, and then people have to learn how to fix fit boxes which are defined by the scale structure. Surpri unsurprisingly, this is one of the reasons why we get sense of alienation um, uh, because actually the, the process optimization that we're talking about means that we as human beings are, tr are actually subservient to those processes. We are trying to work on becoming cogs in a machine and we have to reskill and retrain to become a new kind of cog as the machine keeps adapting. Now, I'm going to use this as one example, the play space that I operate in, which is in financial services. So what you've got is people on one side that have savings to invest. And on the other side, you've got projects um, whereby they are seeking capital from people um, in order to build these capabilities. Now, the reality is as it currently stands now, the individual um, uh, will put their savings into these industrialized processes and the industrialized processes are um, gate kept by a collection of different um, specialties, which are all at large scale. So data is collected at large scale. Analysis is done by uh, industrial scale analytical formats. The financial structuring is done by big banks. Investment decisions come to advisors. So all of these things have to operate at scale. So the individual who is investing in a project is giving their money to big advice channels, big banks, big data providers, and so forth. So surprise, surprise, what is the outcome of that? It is easier to buy a share in Apple than it is to invest in your local community. It is easier to buy shares or bonds in big things, but those big things don't feel or reflect your local needs or your local issues. You have lost the capability to deal with the local. This speaks to, on one level, a massive problem, but also the good news, it's a massive opportunity. It tells us where capital and capitalism needs to go. We need to relocalize and redistribute. The question is how? So setting up, we have a wicked problem. And the wicked problem is that the scale economy has created massive pools of capital, but those massive pools of capital cannot reach local situations. That's the reason why I showed a graph before about real interest rates being zero for almost 20 years. That's the reason. You know, capital just keeps accumulating in these bigger and bigger ponds, but it's just not getting down to, there is a significant portion of the economy that can't get it. Um, and so they're bidding down the yields of, of the large liquid assets to zero. At the same time, our central authorities, they don't know how to get down to the local either. So what are they doing? They're running printing presses. It's not just, the, so we've got a simultaneous situation where we've got 
big businesses buying back their own shares, big pools of capital that don't know how to get to the local at the same time as our central banks are printing money. It's extraordinary. This is a discontinuity that, it, that is being set up. Um, as an, and you know it's not sustainable. So what we've got is financial asset inflation, and that's delivering financial returns, but they're of low quality because they're relying on just printing presses, buying back and bidding up the uh, valuation of these limited entities. At the same time, local communities have lost both the belief and the capability to um, drive their own, meeting their own needs because they have become subservient to this big scale model. What I think is really intriguing here is that if you look at the capabilities of people in the suburbs of the Western world, they have the same weakness of capability, but possibly even more than communities in the developing world. You know, villages in the developing world might be able to look after themselves in a basic way, but struggle to get into the industrial economy. It is intriguing to me that um, the suburbs of the developed world can only enter the industrial economy by getting jobs, you know, through franchises or whatever structures in big meta corporations. That, you know, to actually take authorship of your own, meeting your own needs in your own community requires belief, but it also requires a collection of capabilities and skills will come to in order to be able to design that. So what you've got as a result of this is that uh, communities are weak in terms of capability um, and faith in order to set up a conversation to design their projects and reach out and get capital. And at the same time, capital is weak in getting money to communities and capital is weak in helping communities build that capability. It's a wicked problem. And that's why real interest rates have been zero for so long in the economy. So let's talk about moving towards the solution space here. So the first part of the solution is, is moving the siloed um, specialized scale structures that I showed before. So using financial services um, as an example where you know, each step is undertaken by large organizations which are charging large fees on each of the steps. And at the same time, taking away the authorship, the power of individuals to actually invest in themselves. Um, and that's the most frightening thing. You know, if you had your own project, would you be able to say, I will back my own project and I'd ask my mother or my maiden aunt or et cetera to back me? You know, you know we've lost that kind of capability. So the first thing is, in terms of data and analysis. This is um, the process, the logic of the situation is to remove these silos and move. We've seen it in other areas. You know, we, we've begun to understand in Silicon Valley, the ability to move into shared open um, environments um, uh, that there are significant efficiency advantages. As an aside, one way of thinking about this in the old world model, what you had was a situation where you had large corporations backed by large investment banks developing investment cases to raise capital in themselves. At the same time, you had investors um, doing their um, own analysis, having research teams to analyze and assess whether they wanted to invest in these things. If you talk about process efficiency, there are a collection of uh, duplicated processes taking place on both sides of that equation between the different players. The opportunity is to move these situations into um, open shared environments so that we don't get duplication um, of, of uh, those processes. That drives down the cost and increases the efficiency. So that's the starting premise. And that was our starting premise when we started working in this space. But what became clear that in doing that, that's very logical. The challenge is we can't forget the people. How do people engage with that process? So, you know, you know, many of us are geeks in this room and that go, we go, oh, that's great. You know, low cost, shared, shared analysis and so forth. But financial literacy is actually really um, a challenging question in our communities. 
So we've got to examine how do people engage in this system? I'm trying to go to the next slide. Excuse me, just my screen is frozen. Uh, okay. Apologies, bear with me. Um, all right, so the next point is, so we, in order to engage the system, there's an engagement methodology that needs to be undertaken here. And we're not just ourselves, but people are um, working on um, across the world. Interestingly, somebody else who um, is a friend of Luke's and mine, uh, Fyodor Chenikov, who works um, in the Valley, uh, is using systems of um, evolutionary learning and grounded practice. So what this speaks to is we need uh, to be facilitating and engendering uh, learning and development environments uh, for people at the local to uh, be able to understand their needs and take authorship for driving outcomes and building uh, uh uh, solutions coming from themselves. So the uh, a task is to move from an environment where capital in the past, um, where capital function was, you know, you'd apply a mortgage form or an application form. Now the job of capital in the new order is to actually construct or facilitate a collaborative environment where people can identify their own needs and solutions or business models emerge from this. They're not directed from outside, they emerge from within. Um, so in this sort of environment, we move to a new functioning of um, expertise, um, that it is not instructing people what to do, but it is working with people to build um, local capability. As an aside, this is one of the areas where Luke and I talk have talked a lot and where the participatory budgeting processes start, you'll see they starting to come in through this. Um, uh, within this context, there is something quite revolutionary that needs to take place here. And that is the shift of the role of expertise. So what we've seen, um, and I, you know, I'm going to make a very aggressive statement here, um, that expertise buried in big consulting firms and so forth. We've got so much brain power and so much knowledge, yet we still have these huge endemic problems in the world. The expertise for all its knowledge has failed to get to the vast part of the economy. So this, um, environment that we are talking about gives expertise a um, new structure for engaging with people. So the first thing is expertise needs to listen, not tell. Um, and then there is a way of sharing insight part in a participatory way um, through face-to-face -face human engagement, through human contact. And it's, it's really powerful. People feeling heard is of extraordinary power unto itself. And then from that, we get emerging solutions, like whereby people over time do not rely on the expertise they learn and develop their own skills. Technology has a place to play in this. It's not to direct, but it's to facilitate that shared experience. What is really exciting in this is the shifted role of capital. And this is something that we um, believe and are seeing wholeheartedly. In the past, when you were working at the local and the community space, we've seen globally in the development models, you know, in the developing world, but also in the first world, expertise and money coming in the grassroots, trying to push, trying to teach people what we think is best has proved significantly unproductive. The difference that we are suggesting here is if capital becomes not a push variable, but a pull variable, a carrot, we understand the learning and development processes that are more um, fruitful and they are listening, not telling. 
They are facilitated against a foundation structure where data and process tools can be engaged into that process of yeah, listening and yeah, yeah. telling yeah. with expertise facilitating and giving insights to build. So what you get from integrating these three elements once you add capital at the end, coming through this process, by pulling you through, you get the capital um, to build or develop those initiatives, those businesses and those insights. So by using pull into this thing, we raise the productivity of expertise. I think, you know, uh, it is a global scandal. Uh, maybe it is endemic of the logic, the dumbing down of the scale era. How much money is spent on expertise by um, large corporations and so forth? The cost structures of the large consulting firms with the greatest respect is very high relative to the ability to move the dial. There are some people in Silicon Valley um, that I can introduce you to while working on this problem, how we get greater efficiency out of expertise. But the bottom line is that capital operating as pool using these methodologies means that the productivity of that expertise goes up significantly. I think this speaks um, very strongly to what Luke is doing, you know, having uh, with the schools program and so forth, participatory budgeting, capital decisions to be made, outcomes that be generated, you know, we're speaking from the same hymn sheet here. I don't know if you're going to get there, Chris, but one of the things that I'm going to jump in on and, and yeah. I've been noting things down and some of it's, it's brilliant how at times I, I literally, like I put in the chat log, I just wrote in my notebook on the slide, what's the role of expertise in self-emergent solutions? Because you know, there's, there is a bootstrapping capability, right? I may not have technical expertise, but I think the, the, what you've laid out as part of the history is have we atrophied, like a, a person who doesn't use a muscle, the muscle is going to atrophy, have, have our communities atrophied a bit because of we kind of got to where we are because we got to where we are. And That's you're right. proposing this kind of really powerful new thing. And if you're going to cover it later, then I'm going to, you know, but I just wanted to put a pin in a, a couple of things I wrote down that, yeah. that one of them you just nailed about this role of expertise, because in our experience, there are times where expertise really is needed to help a community make a more wise decision, you know, especially in technical yeah. matters. But I'm wondering if there's this other not stated, but really truly uh this true phenomenon that's talking about like like collaboration and 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 community atrophy because we've lost the ability to be community yeah and, and it's true i'll answer that question i, I don't speak to it in a native side i'll answer it right now and i'm quoting um people like theodore of chenikov and there's a whole body of work on this and that is that to your point we do need to be able to add expertise into equations. There's no question, you know, that's useful. The question is how, and if we look at the psychodynamics of how people learn. So if you just tell people um, this is the best solution and oh, you, you, even if you're saying, I'm gonna teach you how to use my best solution, you're actually atrophying part of the critical engagement processes. Um, in it. So there's a way to introduce that. And this is where um, this idea, and I'm using an, an orthogonal take on this, it's called grounded theory. And it was used by social researchers where rather than asking communities questions of what they need, what they do is they sit with communities and listen to them telling stories of their needs. Then they draw connections between the common factors that are identified in the storytelling so that the needs and the understanding of the community is revealed by the community's storytelling not through the asking so you remove that aspect you hear and then from that if you understand 
into that, you start introducing, and we see this in therapies and so forth, you introduce the expertise in a manner that people feel it is relevant to what they're doing. So it is a new way. So the, the, the value of that new information is unquestionable. It's how it enters most effectively the conversation so that people don't get overawed by the new information and then atrophy immediately defer to the outsider to tell them what to do. So no one is questioning the value of that outside thing. It's the way that you engage it in a process um, in a manner that it's properly incorporated and people learn it and adapt it to their um, situation. Does that answer the question? It does. And I think let's come back to that because where you're going is really compelling. And especially with this slide uh, being uh, associated with the technology side of this value, uh, you know, and, and the, the data gathering and the impact of the choices. I keep going, but I, I'm gonna, I have a couple of other things I've noted, and you've so far been nailing them. But that was one that I did want to bring in is that this like, you know, how do you retrain a a lost skill? How do you retrain a lost muscle, if you will? So the way you retrain it is you actually, and I've spoken to psychologists about this on many instances. It's very clear in therapies. It's very clear when you're dealing with marginal communities. And what is really fascinating about this and profound is that the communities that we have dealt as marginal in the world are not marginal anymore. They're leading edge on this problem, you know, because that's where the, the, the atrophy, and we've seen it in the COVID crisis, the atrophy, the damage that we thought of in the marginal communities, we can now see has penetrated the core. It's penetrated our core. So we can learn from, and the psychological lessons that are taken from how you engage. So the first thing that they need is belief. In order to step up, they need to believe that stepping up can produce a positive outcome. If they don't have belief, they need a narrative ideal to aspire to. So we need to reinvent to tell people that they can make a difference in their own lives. If they don't believe that working on their own problems, and this is why you get people trapped. So the definition of poverty now globally is not defined by income, it's defined by belief in your ability to make a difference. So it's really quite fascinating. So once you go from that belief, you've got to demonstrate to people, so, that, so much as a psychologist or a coach for a football team has to give people belief that stepping up can make a difference. Got it. So there are a collection of factors that can be brought in here. And against that, we can now then use the information technology. So that's why I was saying we need to integrate data and process tools with these human skills of belief engagement. Otherwise, we atrophy the brain. We atrophy the thing. And the, human, and the reality is we need people that the, the jobs of the future are not going to be in process jobs. If we extrapolate out, you know, at the limit condition, all the jobs of the future are going to be in the things that process mechanics can't do because they're going to be done by AI. So we have to actually focus the idea of value creation on what the need that needs to be dealt with is what it is to be, the human condition of meaning and so forth. And those things cannot be answered through processes. So we've got a situation whereby people are going to be looking at their needs, the needs and the, the, that cannot be done by computers and robots and so forth like this. And that's what it is to be. Um, so... Value is created by meeting needs. Um, process techniques are going to do most of those things. So the needs that are going to be unmet value is the need of being life fully expressed. The greatest value is in life fully expressed. So when we think about the future economy, what it is to be in communities about where life is fully expressed, whether it be through self-meaning, working with others, expression, nature, and so forth, they're the jobs of the future. They're the, mean, the value that's going to be met how people, in order to do that, scale does not solve the problem of life fully expressed. So we go back to the original proposition. 
the scale logic of the 19th and 20th century was to solve a problem that the greatest value is by having the most things. We're over that. We've learned that that's done. That's trivial now. The, the most value is to have life fully expressed and create jobs that do that. And in order to do that, scale processes can't do that. Only you can do that for yourself, working with people in the community around you. So we need to relocalize. And that's what this is all about. So information technology um, can give us the data, which shows people when they're doing this stuff, they're actually making a difference in their lives. Let me just quickly, uh, almost out of time. So the highest quality returns are generated by meeting the needs of stakeholders. As a capitalist, as an investor, I can have money. The smart money is now diversifying. It's got some of its money in financial assets because the printing presses are driving those up but it is now also investing in real assets. And the real assets can create sustainable quality returns by meeting needs. Um, what I'm seeing now is that this impact economy, we're at the beginning of a boom in this because we finally understood that it's too dangerous just to get financial returns. Even the smart money now knows to be safe, it's got to meet needs. So we've moved into an environment where greed meets need, boom. Um, so I just want to quickly, this is the evolution of impact. Impact 1.0, this is the birth of impact, was we were going to meet long-term um, social needs um, by giving up profit. So this was like the Gates Foundation. This is the technocratic management of social goods, um, and you give up profit to get impact. We're now in the middle of the ESG phase where actually companies know that they'll be sued if they don't know the risks of the negative externalities, which is measured through ESG, they would have profit and they would acknowledge what their indirect consequences on their consumer are as a risk management thing. And money is pouring into this. But really where we're going forward is profit through impact. So looking at these local needs and so forth, and use those to design better companies and better products. So now that's the birth of the, the, the revolution we're seeing. This Beckham does this through, we, we are invested in this space by helping people integrate capability, um, integrate data and growth equity. So this is thing, we have the opportunity now in this new ecosystem to actually rebuild our local worlds. And that's the part your participatory budgeting thing goes into that. So um, there was one more slide, it seems to have fallen out. Uh, it's gone, but the point I wanted to make, you may, you'll be seeing now that the impact boom has started. Money is pouring into ESG, but it's not pouring into rebuilding local communities. This is the, the growth that threshold is actually getting this money that has been going into ESG because people understand build it meeting needs creates value. How do we get that down to people in the local? And we do that by working with them to build capability. That's what we're working on. And I think that that's the area of the strongest returns and the strongest needs. So that end of, I'll stop the share. Um, uh, are there any questions or discussions? I'm open to, I mean, I've raved at you for all this time. I hope that that was of, of use and of interest. Well, okay, I'm just gonna jump in before Sam takes over because I'll probably never get it alerted <laughs> edgeways with that one, but bravo, like, yay. I'm so happy um, uh, that you shared that. I, I think it's, it's really quite, um, um uh it, it's really quite wonderful and and i would say that to the extent possible we are striving to design first route so that we are in alignment with the profit through impact right meaning if if first route pulls it off we're going to create extraordinary profit that gets in circulated back into the community if, if we can pull this off, I, there's only one other thing that I wanted to jump in on and I'm being selfish and I don't, I kind of hope everyone knows I, I, I'm being selfish, but I think that it was quite profound when you said that the definition of poverty is emerging as this, a belief in the ability to make a difference. And I think that this aligns with a lot of the psychological um, research that we've seen about structure 
uh, uh, you know, the impact of, of kind of consistent structural trauma. But I have a question and I have a challenge. Hmm. Uh, if I'm in America, right, I'm dealing with structural inequity for sure, right? And, and we have in our society, you know, a racist society, right? Uh, if, you, if you think about racism as being kind of a structural advantage or disadvantage for a given group of individuals, I may be impoverished because of the system that I'm in through no belief system of my own per se. And so again, how do you, how do we, other than, you know, working to dismantle these, the, the structure of racism, how do we get at that? So what I would say is the first thing is we know uh, the marginalized know the system is rigged against them or they believe it is. Partially there's victimhood and partially but part is ju justifiable. And I'll give the example. The classic example I saw was um, the former leader of the Labour Party in the UK, Jeremy Corbyn, at the beginning of the GFC, said that they should be rolling the printing presses to build infrastructure in the UK. He mm. was described as mad at that point in time. But then when uh, the value of traditional legacy capital assets in property and so forth were risk, they ran the printing presses. So to the poor, when they, they could have run the printing presses you know, earlier and actually created all these assets and so forth, but they ran them when it was to protect the wealthier. And we've seen the same thing with QE, we've seen in the US, we've seen it with the COVID response and so forth. So it is clear that, and that's why crypto is going through the roof right now. Crypt, the boom in crypto is evidence of the fact that people understand that traditional money is hostage to traditional core value, uh, owners and wealthy, and the thing that you're talking about. So proposition one is um, the traditional center of money is not trusted. Proposition two is if we can create a data, people know what their needs are. They just think they're powerless. To, to do anything about them. So we can flip crypto, for example, if we can say that your needs are valuable, meeting your needs are valuable, and we can give you the information as to what they are, we can actually, for example, this is very wonky, but you, know, you can actually shift crypto to tokenizing meeting need. So the moment you start doing that, you actually start creating a narrative. Now you don't solve it in one hit, but you start moving, and we all know how lean startup works. You start by showing the needs you're meeting and localizing, showing the local value. You can tokenize it, you can barter it, you can trade it, and you can start escalating. So you relocalize the solution backed by data to show that you're effective in doing it. And you start building through that. And there's such massive need and opportunity. And we've seen this model in the development world globally. That's how you do it. it you, you can't wave a magic wand. You've got to start with low hanging fruit and show successes. Find um, people who are winning through doing this. We saw it with the likes of Airbnb and so forth. Um, you quickly start re-dynamizing the local economy by showing how you're meeting local need. Got it. Okay, I'm gonna, I know we only have a few minutes left, but uh, I, I definitely want to open this up um, to anyone else who might want to join in. Um, uh, Sam, did you have something you want to say? Because I think you all know each other. <laughs> well, well, I would be remiss to not at least say hello. Hello, Chris. Um, Hi, Sam. It's lovely, to, it's lovely to hear you talk about uh, talk about this stuff again. For those who don't know, I, I've known Chris for quite a while and, uh, and worked um, with him uh, last year and, and learned a lot and pretty much all of the things that I'm going to talk about later um, uh, sort of derived from all of the stuff that I learned through Chris. But I think the one thing that I found really interesting and I was thinking about is that, you know, when we're talking about the talking about people's belief and their perception of their reality versus using sort of indicators that are used um, and understood as sort of traditional uh, isolated data points that we then put in the aggregate and say, are things working or not? The dynamic of that with also changing the investment decision process so that 
that we have self-categorization and self-selection are mutually reinforcing things and you need both you need it's both parts of the coin and i think that's the thing that really resonated with me uh, about what you were saying I, I want to give an anecdote which is um which was shared to me by um, i keep mentioning theodore he's great um he was talking about dealing with uh, deforestation in Indonesia and Malaysia and orangutan environments. Um, and when they were examining how they dealt with deforestation, um, they uncovered in the complex system that the reason that this was happening was they could try to give incentives to, to stop people chopping down trees. But what they found, the best answer that they identified was actually subsidizing and supporting building a local hospital. And the local hospital cut health care costs and health risk, which meant that when people were sick, they didn't go and sneak off and chop down an acre of wood to pay their health costs. Now, no central solution could have identified, central agency could identify that solution. That solution can only be identified working within the community, listening to it and feeling it and hearing it. And that's a great example of what we're talking about, you know, whereby you give people understanding and authorship, you hear and you derive responses that are adaptive and locally appropriate. So um, I think the thing is, you know, if people are interested, we can show a lot more. I'm happy to have this discussion endlessly, as you know, I can, I can talk underwater. Um, uh, but I, I really believe that there is a revolution necessary. And, you know, what's really happened, what's very interesting with the climate crisis and so forth is that the scale of the need threatens to destabilise the system. And I was speaking to one of Australia's leading data uh, technologists about this and he says that the time that you get the change is when the old platform is burning and so the danger right now and this is I, I was listening to actually a theologian talking about this that we're in an era which is like the reformation when Martin Luther nailed his precepts on what you got was that at that point in time the future could not be predicted from an extrapolation from the past it was a point of discontinuity. So when we look at what I showed you in terms of the economics, we cannot get to the future from extrapolating from the past structures. We are at an inflection now. We cannot describe exactly what that future looks like, but we can understand the sorts of character problems it must deal with. And so what we're dealing with is deep expertise, particularly in technology and so forth, that understands that there's a problem, but it is still largely pale, paid by scale, large scale traditional operators. And so I was talking to this technologist and he said, we were holding our heads in our hands in despair because we sat there for all our knowledge, we cannot solve this problem from what we're doing to get through to that new place. And that's the key thing. This We need to move to a new paradigm. And I think the scale of the problem and the burning platform is we are now at that inflection point. Woo. Is how you get into the new. Okay, we got to stop you there. And man, it's hard to say no, but I've got another person. And, you know, uh, I said this to Harris when I was getting ready to switch to Harris. Chris, it's like, from my perspective, uh, you know, you are near each other because I'm, you know, thousands of miles away in the globe, you look pretty close to each other. Of course, I don't know how far or near you two are to each other. But... Where are you, Harris? I'm looking at your photo. What's that backdrop picture? That looks like a compound. Is that Queensland Uni or? Um... I know that's uh, UNSW. Oh, UNSW. Yes. All right, well, so you're about, uh, I'm in Redfern, so you're about five kilometers from me. That's true. Um... <laughs> that's brilliant. And so first, everyone, thank you, Chris, 